free movement of people, access to better jobs, skills development, reduce poverty and inequality, and inclusive wealth creation for us all in the Caribbean. Our people can be positioned to live rewarding, healthy and enriching lives. What's needed for all of us to prosper? Change in processes, equal access to technology, building resilience in our utilities and food supplies, because it is cheaper to build the dam than mop up the floods. Implementing the region-wide decisions, even if all countries are not on board at first. Yes, this is all possible. And tonight, we will hear how a group of high-powered commissioners has advised us to get it done in the report on the CARICOM Commission on the Economy. Professor Avinash Prasad, Commission Chairman, Dr. Damien King, Fellow Commissioner, and Dr. Jani Remy, Deputy Director of the Shudaf Ramphal Center for International Trade Law, Policy and Services, will chat about the recommendations to build a new Caribbean economy. I'm David Ellis. On behalf of our hosts, the Central Bank of Barbados, welcoming all on television and online to the Caribbean Economic Forum as we discuss putting people at the center of development in the Caribbean. Good evening and a very warm welcome to you. In our quest to put people at the center of development in the Caribbean, a survey was done in several countries in the region and some questions were put to those people. This was one of the questions. Do you believe that Caribbean governments currently put people at the center of their development? Well, only 3% of those surveyed said yes, 37% said no, and 60% said somewhat, but they can do better. A second question was, what must we do better to propel economic development in the Caribbean? 18% wanted more cooperation and collaboration. 23% faster decision-making and implementation. 20% easier movement of people, goods, etc. 3% better planning for natural disasters. 10% more emphasis on digitization, 16% collaborating on international and financial issues, 1% cultural and national differences should be looked at, 1% freer movement of people, and 8% they wanted more investment in better health systems. To discuss with us, Professor Abhinash Prasad, as chairman of the commission, share with us what is it that we have in mind for making the situation better for people in the Caribbean where development is concerned. Good evening. Good evening, David. It's, it's a real pleasure to be with you and, and my fellow uh, panelists uh, and your audience. Um, I really do relish this opportunity. I, I think it's important uh, when we talk about CARICOM and commissions of the economy to to remember that um, we've had commissions before. We, we must be probably the most overly consulted region in the world. Uh, for, for those people who, who collect these things, there must be shelves of, of decaying and yellowing reports uh, about uh, the region. And we were very struck uh, when we began our task of how do we write something that will not end up like all the other reports that are, are politely greeted maybe some mild applause, but then really ignored. And so we thought long and hard about why did previous reports not uh, get implemented? What has been the impediments to progress in the Caribbean region? And we figured there was, we, 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 we concluded that were, there were three key things. Firstly, um, there is a split uh, in, in people's minds that you either do everything together or almost nothing together and we think that's not a not a helpful split so one of our recommendations is something that's called subsidiarity uh, it's, a, it's a long word and what it means is really that you must take decisions at the closest level to people that they're best made so for example if you're deciding how to organize um, garbage collection probably not best done regionally probably best done uh, at the parish level. 
if you're trying to work out, if you're trying to uh, do with gun crime, every country has a different situation, probably best done nationally, not parish by parish and not regionally. So uh, limit the number of things we try to do regionally, focus on those things that really have to be done regionally, um, creating regional markets, uh, dealing um, with our international finance and trade relationships uh, and uh, uh, education, etc. The second key obstacle we think is that um, you know people have a have a have a sort of notion that Caribbean economies, Caribbean countries, are just squabbling with each other all the time, and we never agree. The reality is that there's actually a tremendous amount of agreement, but it's not unanimity. And there are many, many things which are stuck at the CARICOM level, not because no one agreed, but because 14 countries agreed, but not 50, or 13, or 12, uh, or 10. Uh, and so we've come up with an idea which we call enhanced cooperation. And what this means is that if a minimum of five countries agree to progress in a particular way, so let's say to have a fast ferry, let's say to have mutual recognition, of qualifications, um, let's say to have a single data roaming charge uh, for telecommunications. If five countries, at least, hopefully more, if five countries agree to move ahead and the other 10 are not going to be made worse off, then the five can move ahead. So we have subsidiarity giving us focus, enhanced cooperation allowing us to be unstuck and moving ahead. And the final thing we found was that a lot of the causes of arguments are, uh, and this isn't just at the CARICOM level, of course, uh, is money. Uh, and we squabble most about money, who's contributing most or least. Uh, and so we uh, looked at all the things we need to do as a region. And we thought we're going we're gonna to discipline ourselves and focus on those four or five things that actually don't require money, but will make a big difference uh, in how we move as a region. So uh, let, let me begin by saying that governance is critical to faster decision making uh, if a greater cooperation. And a lot of our report is really about how do we get the Caribbean moving again, mobility, uh, fast Caribbean. That's why our report is actually called Caribbean 9.58. And that may be a bit unusual if you're not an athletics fan, but of course 9.58 is uh, Usain Bolt's record-breaking uh, 100 meter dash. Uh, and one of the messages we were trying to make is we need to move the Caribbean faster. We can be faster. Heck, uh, the fastest Caribbean person, the fastest person in the world is a Caribbean person. Okay. Now, let me hear from Dr. Damien King as we look in more detail at the decisions, the, the recommendations that you have actually made, those things that you believe we need to do faster. Dr. King. An important discussion to... for the region. Uh, and, and Avi set up the discussion quite nicely by pointing out that the three obstacles to movement to action that we have observed in the past is getting that unanimous political will, getting having the bureaucratic capacity to implement it even when there's agreement, and the financial cost. And what we have, we have framed this in a way that removes all of those obstacles, and therefore we can now focus on what the key actions ought to be given all of that. And we come down to looking at free movement of people uh, and goods. And this is where, you know, one of the problems we've always had is that the difficulty of increasing trade in the Caribbean has not only been the artificial obstacles we put in place, you know, the tariffs and the phytosanitary requirements and so on. A part of the difficulty has been just the geography, that, that we have small islands with small populations separated by sea. So putting in place a, a system that would facilitate private sector investment in a fast ferry would reduce those, those, the cost of transportation. And if we can get the regulatory changes in each island or in, in even five islands to take advantage of enhanced cooperation, 
then that will allow people to you know drive onto the ferry uh, go onto the ferry and come off the ferry and be able to access the neighboring island in a fairly efficient manner and that could move people and goods far more quickly that's one issue we also looked at the issue of mobility of labor the CARICOM single market and economy made a huge deal about trying to promote attempting to promote free movement of, of labor mobility of labor but the fact is the process is difficult uh, bureaucratically and so we propose lowering the skills requirement to just two CXCs and making it automatic in so far as once you can demonstrate you know perhaps buy a certificate on your smartphone or something embedded in your passport that you have those two CXCs then there's no bureaucratic process beyond that you arrive at immigration you have your evidence and you're in and you can work and stay as long as you like uh, we looked at the importance of of overcoming financial integration by by focusing on regional financial certification that is one of those areas have I talked about subsidiarity that is one of those areas in which which is best solved regionally because presently each financial institution in each country has to go through the same process of certifying that you know they are compliant in terms of anti-money laundering and and financing counter-terrorism financing terrorism and each each of these entities is duplicating the same activity so if we could do that on a regional level with some kind of regional financial certification then again that lowers the costs tremendously of of financial integration so those are the directions that we want to move in that we think satisfies you know getting past the hurdles that have it so so carefully pointed out to dr Genevieve remy uh, one of the challenges we face is the situation here where in many instances the people themselves do not feel that they have the power to get these things done you have to depend upon the government this pitch that we are making here tonight is to whom? Is it the people? Is it the leaders? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And just as a point of clarification, I'm not one of the commissioners. I didn't um, study economics, number one, and I don't have that esteemed status. So my job here is to sort of look at the report and give a little bit of a bird's eye outsider's view of it. The question you asked is really an important one. I have some comments to make on what Avi, um, well, P Professor Prasad and Dr. King said. But on your question about who, to whom are these recommendations actually pitched? Well, the report espouses itself as one that is people-centered. And indeed, there is a section of the report, and I would invite the people who I'm speaking to tonight to actually read the report. It's a 47-page report as opposed to reams and reams of pages we've seen in other commission reports that come out of the region. And the idea is really to move the direction of Caribbean integration and economic integration from the halls of power and these rooms where decisions are made by politicians so that it is felt, it is felt by the people. And on that score, uh, I think the jury is out on whether we've really manage in this report, I think, to really capture the imagination of the people in the sense that the people that are spoken about really predominantly are, is the private sector in the report. Um, clearly, the recommendations are aimed at making people's lives better. Dr. Kin spoke about freer movement of people, the ferry system. I got excited about that. Uh, but in current discourse globally, when we talk about people-centered development, we're talking about moving towards sustainable, inclusive decision-making, uh, getting people from the margins. And I saw in your interview, in, in your survey, that people still felt that they were not at the center of government development planning. And so the question is, how far does this report capture these traditionally marginalized people, women, uh, disadvantaged groups, the youth, the youth. If, uh, if you read any of the reports coming out of Africa, coming out of the EU, even coming out of the United States, it's about 
labor's rights. It's about women. It's about younger people. And I think one of the things about the input legitimacy of this report is I understand that the commissioners were trying to get some of the recommendations going for recommendations, manageable ones, ones that could be taken and run with, one that didn't rely very heavily on government initial outlay. But did we get the balance right with the legitimacy of flagging some of these issues and getting persons from the region in these marginalized sectors to contribute to it? And it's, it's not a criticism in so much as it is people-centered is about moving away from the trickle-down economics, imagining that production systems and markets are going to bring these values and these uh, added benefits to the common person. And it's around moving from the bottom up. And so understanding the place of people within the broader development focus of the Caribbean. Now, Avi mentioned quite a few topics on the subsidiarity, uh, the idea of enhanced cooperation, the idea of government outlay not being something that's going to constrain the ability uh, of Caribbean integration to take place. I have comments on these, um, but I will defer to a, a more specific questions to me on it. But I, I did want to touch on one or two of these um, being so central to the focus of the report and give some of my views on it. But I will, I will wait for the, another opportunity to do that. Back to you, Thank David. you. P Professor Prasad, since this report was released, many people would be curious to find out what progress, if any, has been made towards the goal of implementation? Sure, David. And I, I think at, at some point early on, it would be great if we can actually drill down on what do we mean by people-centric, because I think that is a, a phrase people like to use. Um, but I've noticed um, here in Barbados, when we talk about people-centric development, um, there's then a pause and people say, but, but what's the economic strategy? Because ultimately, I think most of us still have in our minds the belief that an economic strategy is not about people. It's about factories. It's about uh, firms. Uh, and so I think we really need to have a, a discussion about what people-centric really means and, and maybe to make it real to talk about the lives of a, of a particular person and how they'd be impacted by the things we're doing in this report. But um, I do think that uh, we were very focused, as, as Janiv said and, and Damien, on things that were practical and could be achieved. In a way, we were throwing down a gauntlet to the officials and our leaders by saying, well, if you really do believe in Caribbean uh, development, in regional development, um, in greater integration, well, here are four fairly practical things you could do without the obstacles. You don't need 15 people to agree. You don't need to spend a lot of money. Let's see if you really believe in this stuff. Uh, and I have to say there has been a fair bit of movement. So there's already, uh, indeed on Monday, there's going to be a negotiation uh, with the major telecom companies in the region uh, to try and reach a negotiated agreement on one of the recommendations of the report, which is that uh, we'll have much lower data roaming charges. Either there's a flat data roaming charge for any CARICOM citizen moving around the region, or maybe there's no data roaming charge and they pay as if they were w within their own country. Uh, and uh, that's, that's one step that's being made. The drafters are currently drafting what subsidiarity and enhanced cooperation means to be presented uh, at a CARICOM heads of government meeting uh, later in the year. Uh, there's already been a, this discussions around fast ferry uh, uh, of a handful of countries. You know, that needs, as Damien says, um, some agreement on um, how, do we, uh, uh, how do we move goods uh, on and off a ferry very quickly? How do we allow people to come on and off a ferry very quickly? How do we allow people to take their, their, their cars and to drive around in another country for a week and come back again? Uh, and so uh, there's been some discussion about that uh, already. Um, uh, there's been a, a fair bit of discussion about uh, greater mobility of people uh, and the heads of agreement, the heads of government, uh, I think, are very much in support of our lowering the threshold and also making the documentation 
you know, do you have two CXCs or more? Do I need to go to li line up for a long time a government to get a certificate which says that? Or can I just carry that information on my mobile phone at all times with me? So I would say there's a fair amount of, uh, of movement on a number of the issues in the report. The, the big thing, uh, so we talk a lot about mobility in the report, how do we speed up things in the Caribbean? But one of the other things unrelated to that or less related to that is dealing with climate change. We lie on the front line of the war against climate change. We need to invest heavily in resilience, uh, resilience of, of, of physical things, roads and bridges and buildings, but resilience too of our livelihoods, resilience of, our, uh, of individuals, of people, resilience of our healthcare systems or our education. This and report also, uh, we, the report also puts a lot of emphasis on digitization. Right, but let me just finish the resilience point, David, because I think it's a very important point in terms of things that have already started. You, you asked me, you know, what movement has there been? So um, the International Financial Corporation of the World Bank has started a pilot study uh, with Barbados and Dominica to develop uh, a rating of resilience for projects that the private uh, savers in the Caribbean might invest in based on the rating. And this is a, a, a project that will con uh, contribute a return, but it's also developing resilience and sustainability for the region. Uh, yes, you're right. Digitization is a big aspect uh, and governments around the region are already uh, moving uh, hard on that. But we think that a key, uh, key area to make digitization real is we need to have cheaper uh, communication and cheaper data roaming in particular as we move abroad. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move next to uh, one of the other questions that we posed in the survey. Uh, this particular question had to do with whether uh, people were confident that CARICOM can resolve the many challenges faced in the region and as you can see from this response, there was basically a 50-50 split. And I'd like to get the, the response of the, the panelists on this I'm particular I'm really question. surprised by that, David. 50-50, I would have thought it would be like 80% saying no. Uh, because, uh, and, and maybe it depends where you did the, where you did the survey. I suspect, well, good to ask Damien, if you did that survey in Jamaica, I think there's a lot of skepticism about regional integration. Uh, partly because we've not delivered on many things. Uh, many things that we've talked about have just not happened. Uh, so I really think there's skepticism. And, and we really tried to, 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 to deal with that skepticism head on by looking at the obstacles CARICOM has had so far. But uh, is, do you think it's 50-50 in Barbados? It's hard for me to say. David? I would have to do a I certainly would have to do another survey, I suppose, to find out whether it was 50-50 in Barbados. But you know, there are many doubts within many of the Caribbean countries, and that's the background against which this discussion is taking place. Uh, there are so many people who say, basically, we promised so much and delivered so little, and we are really challenged. So that brings us now back to some of the points that uh, Geneve, uh, Dr. Geneve, uh, Remy wanted to expand upon, uh, you, you certainly are free to do so. Well, I don't want to jump at the gun. I think, Damien, uh, you were given the floor. I don't know if you want to take it, but I, I, I can jump in. Sure. Damien? Okay. Yeah, Damien? I don't know if Damien can hear. Let me, let me just start on the, the point the, the point we come back to this idea of enhanced cooperation which uh, in other speak in other fora that I've actually um, worked in is called variable geometry you know this idea that everybody doesn't need to start at the same time as long as we end up at the same place eventually and there's this has happened in the European Union this has happened at the WTO with some controversy. And it certainly isn't something that I think is new to even CARICOM. Uh, within the framework of CARICOM, there is an accommodation for lesser developed countries, which understands that structurally all countries are not equally endowed. Um, but what is being proposed here is a system of decision making that would basically allow countries, once a decision has been taken and all have agreed, to move forward at different paces. 
Now, economically, it doesn't seem to have any objection. Uh, an IMF report that I read su su supports the view that CARICOM should move in that sort of differentiated, gradual way. I think my bigger concern is where it works in the EU, for instance, in the European Union, where a one, one third can move ahead and the, the two thirds don't have to, you have critical mass. Even if uh, the Germany and France alone move, it warrants or it justifies some countries moving ahead just because of the mere population size. In CARICOM, we have 15 countries that are small. So the question becomes, one is economic. Is there going to be enough of a critical mass if some move ahead, we put in place all of the regulatory alignment that is necessary, and then there is no movement of all? In Africa, East Africa, there's a story there about variable ge geometry or enhanced cooperation. In East Africa, some countries, they call them the, 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 the coalition of the willing. Kenya, uh, Rwanda, and Uganda moved ahead. But it ignited the ire of Tanzania and Burundi. And what happened is you had a fractured movement. We don't want to see that at CARICOM. And I know the commission has put in some bells and whistles to ensure that all agree to move before some move uh, eventually. But what you also don't want to have is a system of stasis where because some have moved, it removes sort of the impetus for all to move in a region that is formed on the basis that to get economies of scale and in order for us to become viable entities, we all need to be in this together. So I think that's just the one little uh, wrinkle that I have with this idea from more of a political economy than an economic per se argument. The other uh, I mean, point- Before you go on to the other one, uh, yes. Janiv, let me just respond to that one in particular. Go ahead. Uh, what, what we envision is that if five countries are allowed to move ahead. You know, for most of the initiatives that CARICOM wants to make, there are there there is reticence that is sometimes based on on valid considerations, uh, at other times is based on not having enough information on what the dangers and risks are. What we are presenting here is an opportunity for five willing countries to go ahead and to demonstrate what we can call proof of concept. And what that does is it lowers the hurdle for other countries who might want to try it, but are not willing to take on the risks in, in an environment where this is a new development and they don't know how it's going to turn out. And once they see it operating, then other countries on a one-by-one -one basis will find it easier to join up with something that, is, that already seems to be working. So it's simply a question of, of lowering the, the, the hurdle, lowering the, the, the knowledge gap to, to, to taking on initiatives. And that is why I think it's not, a, it's not a way, it's not an alternative to everybody participating. It is a means to get to everybody participating. In just 30 seconds, how urgent is this for the region? Well, yesterday we need we need, which part which recommendation which where, where this report yesterday sure. i mean a lot of a lot of what's in, contained in it i think has been mooted before what's different about this report is one it's coming from eminent persons from the region and outside the region so clearly it has this added oomph but also i think it, what it tries to do is put things that are manageable on these rails. And I think it does so to some extent there. I, I think this emphasis on it not being, you know, dependent on political action sort of muddies some of the point because it does need regulatory action and regulatory action is human resources. And ultimately it's people in ministries that have to ensure gonna, the regulatory alignment happens. We're gonna have to ask you to stick a pin there. When we come back, we are going to hear from our social media moderator.
Jamaica and its workforce are advancing quickly. Life-changing opportunities are arising. You need training and support. We are the Renewed Heart NSTA Trust, committed to providing new and emerging skills training and opportunities. Come to heart. We'll help you claim your place in the workforce of the future. What if they knew that you abused her? Her family? Mr. Jones. At your colleagues, how will they look at an abuser? When the law comes knocking, you'll have nowhere to run. The Brown, you're under arrest. Please get up. Hands behind your head and interrupt your fingers. Turn your back on abusers. Report gender-based violence to the police. There's no excuse for abuse. Call the Bureau of Gender Affairs at 876-754-8577. Jamaica. Home of the resilient, passionate, and hardworking. A people and a nation who have achieved and defied all odds. Working to keep their economy growing, their country thriving. From investments made in innovative opportunities and exports demanded globally. We have a vision, now within our grasp, where Jamaica becomes the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. We will not let go of this vision. We will grow. We will overcome these challenging times and look to the future with hope and positivity. These are special times. The world as we know it has changed, but home will always be in our hearts. And in Jamaica, you can always find a home. Think you know Jamaica? Look again. You will be surprised. Yo, 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 this is hot day. Committed to reducing the impact of disasters occurring in Jamaica. We're ever ready to assist you before, during, and after a disaster. But everybody have a role to play, so make we work together and follow the plan. Whether rich or poor. Joseph is moderating the online part of our discussion. Good evening, Dr. Scott Joseph. Good evening to you, David, and good evening to our viewers. Many interesting and important points were raised on the platform, and they were in line with the theme of air transportation costs, socializing, minimizing monopoly, and promoting competitive trade. Um, David, a key word that came out of these discussions is how. How can CARICOM provide recommendations that can help our countries to manipulate and have maximum returns in an environment such as now, which we are constrained by many different events. Secondly, how can we ensure that once implementing these strategies, that they can do so in such a way that not just some countries benefit, but all countries in the region. The, the main restrictions we have seen so far are those with respect to movement of people in terms of physical space. Now we are forced to deal with the virtual space. So an important question I want to put forward to our panel tonight is how can we ensure this time around, what can CARICOM recommend this time around to ensure these strategies are implemented in such a manner that they help us to achieve the expected returns? Because lack of implementation strategies and, and lack of um, indicators would not be able to help us to get to those points. So to Dr. King, Dr. King, um, what can you um, put forward to our viewers in terms of priorities for dealing with um, lack of alignment? Can these policies, suggestions be tailored in such a way to ensure individuals, each individual are given the opportunity to strengthen the ability to, to succeed in such an environment, global, economic, 
and environmental challenges. Um, Avanish Prasad, your question has to deal with um, transparency and accountability in terms of metrics. Are there any metrics put forward in the report that would allow Caribbean countries to determine the, the way forward? How do they get to that standard of social status, of being socially and centrically um, developed? Are there any metrics developed? What is the role of CARICOM in terms of providing a standardized approach for measuring where they are in terms of people-centric policies that are being put forward? Thank you very much. Thank you. So that first question goes to you, Dr. Damian King. And that, and along with that, um, yes, Dr. King. You talk about the how, and, and it's an important, it's an important question. One does not have to be a, a student of regional economic institutional history to see the chasm that exists between what is talked about and even agreed to enthusiastically at heads of government's meetings, you know, they take place twice a year for a half a century and the reality of what actually gets implemented. That somehow the how does not happen. And Avi talked about the difficulty of getting unanimity when even a vast majority uh, of the heads agree to move in a particular area. Even more scandalous, one might say, are the occasions, and they are numerous, when all the heads agree. But when they have to go back to their countries, and each country has to ratify and implement, then you come upon the obstacle of domestic politics, you know, it's quite easy when you're in a room full of your friends, your peers at the heads of government meeting, to you know, slap the table in agreement, knowing full well that when you get back home to your home country, you need to win the next election. And so implementation gets founded on that. And even if it doesn't get founded on that, then it does so on, on simple bureaucratic capacity to implement much of what has been agreed to. And that is why it is so important that the how has been tackled by the proposal for enhanced cooperation. That is going to, that is going to go a far way to, to getting us towards action taken and closing that chasm between what seems to be agreed to and action being taken. Before we come to before we okay. come back to, to you uh, for, for an expansion on that, we're going to take some WhatsApp messages and some emails as well. And we still have the question which has been posed to Professor uh, Prasad. Sure. So let's let's see what comes up, to, uh, what's coming to us as it relates to these uh, WhatsApp messages and emails. This one is, what is the first initiative that CARICOM has identified to pilot using the change in the unanimity rule? So they are, that person is concerned about that unanimity rule. Uh, Professor Persaud, do you want should we, to Should we get some that? other WhatsApp questions? Because I, I think there yeah. is a there yes. is a holistic answer that I want to give, um, uh, okay. really, about what do we mean as you drill down. So now you've got the governance bit sorted out. What else is in the report about what should be done? So let, let's have a few more WhatsApp so we can respond let's to them. Let's see what other messages are there. Um, if you're talking about free movement of people, Shouldn't we also consider the other issues which come uh, with this effort? For example, airfare, healthcare, social security, access to education at a similar rate as citizens, property purchases, etc. So that's another question there for you. Great. So, so now we're really getting into the meat of what we mean by these things. You know, we, we, we began by talking about how the governance of CARICOM, in our view, is broken. And we have presented a fix, uh, a fix on subsidiarity, enhanced cooperation, 
focusing on the kind of integration efforts that don't actually need tons of money but are necessary. Um, so what let's draw, what, what does people centric development mean? Um, it, it means that uh, development, in our view, is uh, enables people to have the choice to lead the life that they wish to lead. And it's centered on the person. So let's let's put it in the, you know, David, over the years that you've, you've quizzed me on various economic issues, you like to say, what does this mean for the ordinary person in Barbados? And so let, let's, let's use an example. Let, let's imagine a, a young lady, maybe she's 18 years old, her name is Jazz, uh, she lives maybe in Barbados, and uh, she's left school a couple of years previously, she has a couple CXCs. Um, and what we're talking about in, in this environment with the CARICOM uh, report and its, its recommendations is that Jazz will be able to go online uh, and get a certificate uh, for a course she's doing. Um, and that certificate is going to be accepted across the Caribbean. Uh, today we do not have uh, a regional mutual recognition of certificates and that actually segments our uh, our countries and our markets. So Jazz is able now with a certificate to get a job uh, employed by a Jamaican company. Uh, she's able to do it even though she's still in Barbados. So she works in Barbados, the Jamaican company says a financial services company. That company previously had real trouble moving to Barbados. But now we've got a single uh, anti-money laundering agency and a single financial conduct agency for the entire region. And that allows the financial services companies and other companies to be able to locate all over the region. They need to put a certain amount of capital in each country to compensate their, their customers if, if things go wrong, but they're able to passport themselves, go across the entire region. That's one of our uh, recommendations. Um, uh, Jazz um, uh, did uh, interview, uh, uh, went off to the Jamaican company for, for a three-month internship, uh, and she had her mobile phone with her. Uh, and she did not ki get killed by her data roaming charges because she paid the same data roaming when she was in Jamaica as when she was in Barbados, another of our recommendations. And when Jazz sits down for dinner tonight, um, uh, on her plate will be food that's been um, uh, has been uh, shipped over on a fast ferry uh, from Dominica. Fresh food, fresh food, because we have a nutrition security problem. Our people are eating badly, getting ill. This is creating a fiscal and a health crisis. Uh, and uh, we're going to use the tax system to subsidize fresh food uh, um, and to, to raise revenues from processed food that's making us ill. So she's going to have a lot more fresh food on her plate fresh food that is grown here in the region uh, using our recommendation uh, on uh, supporting nutrition security. And she's sitting on some Trinidadian built furniture uh, that was ordered by her, her parents the week before where they, they called up uh, one evening and it was delivered the next day on a daily fast ferry. So um, uh, Jazz is able to operate in this world. She's got the right certificate. And by having this certificate and doing this job, she's able to command for herself a better standard of living because the key and this is my final point the key to the new economy we're going we're moving to a digital economy is that we're operating globally and where we are on that global chain is very important if we do nothing our people will increasingly be doing things that everyone else is doing and their wages will be falling and falling and falling uh, many of you may have heard of uber Uber is a, a digital uh, taxi service where anybody with a car can effectively be a taxi driver. Uh, and that has been fantastic for us as consumers of taxis. It's been really bad if you're a taxi driver. Taxi driver wages have gone down. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we need to make sure that our people in this new world are able to be at the higher end, be able to command higher incomes because they've got skills that are in demand and they've got certification that can show that and they've got the but, experience my final point they have an experience based around a regional market we need regional procurement of software technology we're doing it nationally and we're not big enough to do that so it ends up going importing from external companies well let me introduce um, one of our interveners and 
uh, uh, Junior. But in the meantime, let me stay with you uh, as the panelists. Uh, look, we are in a situation where we have been fighting COVID. Uh, the economies of these countries have really been hard pressed and set back. And for all the ideas that we are talking about, including that idea of the ferry service, I'm sure most people are going to be asking the question, so where is this money going to come from? How are we going to uh, interface with the international community in all these circumstances and to get investor confidence to be able to do all of this? Perhaps uh, you, uh, Dr. Damien King, could respond to that and uh, Dr. Uh, Janine Remy. Okay, thank you very much, David. Uh, you know, if we, if we are successful in, in making further movement on the recommendations in the commission report, and it seems already because there has been widespread acceptance by the heads of government uh, and, and the report has been well received, you know, even, even all the way here in Jamaica, I can tell you, that, that is going to increase investor confidence. What is more, you talk about where the money is going to come from. Amounts of money are being spent on inefficient ways of transporting people and goods. So what the fast ferry is going to do is reduce the cost of transportation for people and goods. So that creates the motivation for the investment and, and the money to support it is already there because more is being paid now on less efficient and and more costly means of transporting goods and people so certainly as far as that part of the solution is concerned you know th th there are no obstacles to that add a may couple I, things david just, because may, i've actually may, been may involved I just, but can, just, I, can i just uh, talk about the fast yeah, ferry because I, I, i've been involved no. in negotiating the fast <laughs> ferry here in the caribbean we've actually got a series of negotiations going on on the fast ferry and I want to, to emphasize uh, Damon's point, which is that the, the private sector will buy the fast ferries and operate the fast ferries if we make four or f three or four regulatory changes. That's the problem. Today, uh, we have re regulatory obstacles in the Dominicas and St. Vincent's of this world exporting their fresh food into Barbados. Today, we have regulatory obstacles into people taking their cars, going to other countries, using the cars for a week and coming back. Uh, we have regulatory obstacles to cargo and people being able to go on and off a ferry and it to go around to five different islands uh, in a day. If we solve those regulatory issues, we create the income streams that allow the investors, this is Damon's point, to invest in the fast ferry. If I may. Sure. Uh, so so, so I, I think there's so many things that have been said, it's hard to kind of catalog them. But the idea of, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, acceptance of the heads of government from what I'm hearing from uh, Professor Prasad and Dr. King um, is a great thing. I mean, these are not uh, difficult intellectually to understand um, in terms of the, the reach of the proposals. But I think there's, there's need for caution because just yesterday I read that uh, at a co-ted meeting, there was acceptance of the idea that gradually more and more skilled categories of workers would be added to the list that can move freely. And here we have a proposal from the commission saying that two or more or more than two CSECs, so, so secondary credentials, is going to allow people to have the same rights that these hitherto skilled persons uh, could, could actually uh, use to move. So there needs to be a reckoning. Which direction are we going in? I'm for all persons with minimum credentials to move. I think there's a larger question of how it is that we have 40 and 50 and 60% of our young people only achieving two C-secs. Uh, but that's a, that's a separate question. The other point that uh, Avi made was the regulatory changes. And, and I think that's something that hankers back to a point I made earlier, which is I think it's a fallacy to think the reason CARICOM hasn't worked so much, and we hear implementation deficit, but I don't think it has been that much outlay financially, at least in recent years, has been required. It's really these regulatory uh, misalignments. So when we say the fast ferry idea, which has been mooted before, 
And I see that Avi has been in negotiations with potential uh, fast ferry operators. When we need to break that lock jam, we're still confronting the same problems we have had before, which is how do we get these lock jams regulatory wise to be moved? How are we going to ensure insurance companies from one car that is being driven in St. Lucia and then goes to the ferry and can go uh, to Barbados and drive all around? What's the process for that? And I think if, if I could say one thing about the report is I want to know the details of that. I think our commissioners are well placed. These are people who are in the know. These are people who understand the dynamic. I would have liked to see these details in the report. Also, all of the four recommendations, as brilliant as, as they are, require some kind of intergovernmental committee to agree. It requires human resource outlays for it to happen. We've been here before in CARICOM. So the idea is, how is it actually going to be different this time? And the last point I would make, uh, and to commend the report, is this idea of democratizing the approach to CARICOM integration. I think we, we have a lot to blame our leadership for, but I don't think every single thing is at the doorstep of the CARICOM secretariat who is filled with persons who are working feverishly, feverishly all the time to get uh, some of these projects moving, or even the politicians. I think it's time for the private sector to step in. So the idea of the fourth recommendation, I'm going to give that fourth recommendation more airtime than the commissioners have, which is this idea of these resilience bonds, this idea of building back better and ensuring that the the persons in homes build their homes more safely we so that we're dealing with, we're not dealing with starting from scratch every time we have a hurricane. We, uh, we have to take, we'll take a question. We, we, have to, we have to take a break here and take a question, a WhatsApp question. Okay. Let's see what that is. It says Dr. King made mention of pursuing regional standards. Is he suggesting that we establish regional standards that satisfy ourselves or standards that will meet and in some cases surpass international standards, Dr. King? Well, my reference was to having common standards. You know, we can decide amongst ourselves at what level we would like them to be. That's our decision. But the important thing is that we can achieve a lot more cooperation with common standards. And let me just very quickly use the opportunity to respond to the point that Janiv asked about about movement of labor. You know, there's probably no single area um, of policy that has a wider gap between what people fear and what the consequences are actually going to be than free movement of labor. You know, if, if we have free movement of anybody with two CXCs certificates, first of all, you're still exempting two thirds of the population of the region because only about a third of the population has at least two CXCs. Second of all, out of that, the vast majority don't want to go anywhere else. You know, even in the Caribbean, people prefer them yard. So what we're talking about here is really facilitating the movement of a relative, relatively small number of people who are going to solve problems for the companies and the businesses and the opportunities that need to take advantage of it. Well, next we are going to hear from one of but, our interveners. But okay, and then David, I'll have to come back to something else, Jenny. A really great question, Jenny posed to us. Well, well, let's let's hear from you first, and then we will. Okay, we will go to so the I mean, I think that the the questions Jenny posed really highlights the direction the report went into. So she's saying that you know, Coted, uh, which is having a, there's a there is a a a strong almost unanimous agreement uh, on you know broadening slowly the skills uh, that are accepted for for for. Um, uh, for free movement, the commission report is arguing for uh, if you've got two CXCs, you can move. And and how do you square the circle between these two things? Enhance cooperation. You will find five countries out of the 15 who are happy and content with the two CXC threshold, especially those countries that are very underpopulated uh, in the region, whether it's a Belize or a Guyana or others, and they are desperately short of people. Once you got those five starting, to Damien's point, when people... Major area in high school for me was IT and EDPM. I did that for the lives. That there was a drive for more of technology. So I decided to take this step. Hello, 
Jamaica. My name is Patsy Edwards Henry. I am Dr. Mindy Fitzenly. I am Dr. Andrew Manning. COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on our families. Over 21,000 persons have been infected. We now have a safe, effective COVID-19 vaccine. I will take the vaccine. Vaccinate, Vaccinate to, to stay, stay safe. safe. This is an important message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. The Forestry Department is leading the implementation of the National Tree Planting Initiative which seeks to plant 3 million trees in three years, one for each Jamaican plus a little extra for good measure. So I'm inviting each Jamaican to visit our nurseries across the island and collect your tree seedling and make your mark towards this great goal for Jamaica. If you are 60 or older like me and have underlying health conditions such as high blood pressure, and diabetes, you are at a greater risk for severe illness or death from COVID-19. After more than a year of being under COVID restrictions, it is also time to do what is necessary to get back to life. That's why senior citizens have been prioritized for vaccination. The vaccine is safe and effective. I have taken it and I'm feeling just fine. I've also taken the vaccine and I feel so much more at ease. Miss P, the vaccine is safe and you can get back to doing all the things you enjoy doing. And definitely get back to my church. Get vaccinated and get back to life. This is an important message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Next, from Trinidad, we hear from one of our young interveners. She is Rukaya Scott of the Economic Society at the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies. Good evening, Rukaya. Hello, good evening, everyone. So my question here today is for the panel, and my opinion is that the Caribbean should ideally be one united force, seeing that we share so many similar structural vulnerabilities, such as natural disasters, dependencies on one revenue earning sector, and our shared history of colonialism. And we also share a lot of the similar socioeconomic issues, such as crime, access to food and healthy um, and clean water, education, gender and income inequality and the list goes on and many sustainable development models have been crafted and yet the Caribbean still seems to be one step behind. The donut economic model was developed to help countries solve these very socioeconomic issues by working towards achieving social equity in a manner where we protect our planet. So given that climate change is the crisis of the 21st century, and given that the Caribbean will be and is already at a great disadvantage, what are some additional solutions to that already mentioned? Or how can we as a region advocate for more um, in, within our region and on the international platform to lobby for more stringent policies to mitigate the effects of climate change and to possibly discourage further practices that lead to environmental degradation. Thank you very much, Rakaya Scott in Trinidad. And we will also take some emails at this point uh, so that you can have a mix of questions to which you can respond. Um, this one is, are we being overly optimistic in expecting free movement of people and goods? Then we cannot get over the important legal hur hurdles amongst the Anglophone members, all fully embracing the Caribbean Court of Justice as their final court in all its jurisdictions. That's one additional question. Who's gonna take that and, and respond to Rakaya Scott's question as well? Well, let me kick can off I, the bit on, think, our, uh, on, oh, sorry, Jenny, if you go ahead. No, can I just take the CCJ question, because that's my favorite topic. Um, I actually, uh, just to recall that the, the Caribbean Court of Justice is the court of final um, instance for all matters dealing with trade. 
So all of these intra-regional squabbles we have, including the common external tariff or free movement of persons. We know Tomlinson and Shanique Myrie, these were headlining status. These actually, in my view, demonstrate the success of our regime uh, because these individuals were able to bring cases uh, against member states in circumstances where this never existed before. And so it's actually a triumph and it's demonstrating that we are feeling more empowered and now we're seeing cases with countries against countries brewing. We're feeling more empowered to utilize the framework that uh, we have been given to adjudicate disputes. So I actually see it as a positive development that we can settle our disputes amicably. On the climate change question, I know Avi is chomping at the bit to get here. This is one of my, and I'll be short, this is actually one of my pet peeves a little bit with the report. Again, I think we have esteemed persons who know these issues inside out. And what I was as a trade person expecting to see and hoping to see is how do we utilize our collective voice on this existential issue of climate change in the variety of fora in which we are engaging individually and collectively. So this idea of a vulnerability index, this idea of utilizing uh, indicators relevant to climate change as part of our uh, request for concessional financing to IFIs is front and center of our existential challenges. And I was hoping that the report would bring together some of these framing issues of how we utilize CARICOM as a collective, particularly on climate change, to make our voices heard more forcefully in climate change negotiations, as well as before IFIs, before World Trade Organization bodies, et cetera. But I'll, I'll leave it there and let the other panelists jump in. And I'd like to hear uh, Professor Prasad respond to the question which was posed by Rukaya Scott. Uh, either Professor Prasad or Dr. Damien King. Uh, I'll have a first go at it and, and, and invite Damien uh, to help out. Um, so climate change is, is the big issue for the future. Um, I mean, all, all of these big issues are really different, uh, different windows on the same fundamental problem of inequality. Because if you look at who, who ends up suffering most from climate change, who ends up suffering most from issues of, of, of recession, of COVID, uh, of financial inclusion, it tends to be the same set of people. So uh, it's a big issue, but it, uh, we, we must always be rooted uh, in uh, tackling it by being very concerned about how different people are fearing. So we're not, as a region, a big producer of the uh, greenhouse gases, uh, but sitting as we do um, in the front line on climate change, near, near the equator is where there's going to be the highest increases in sea level and where there is going to be the most intolerable increases in temperatures. And so we need to, to build uh, and mitigate, uh, build adaptability and mitigate, and it's going to be expensive. And so we need to mobilize uh, the savings that are in the region, the savings in our credit unions and our pension funds and our insurance companies uh, and our banks. Uh, and this money wants to be be better used, uh, used, uh, but they want to have greater clarity. And the thing about resilience is that, that one of the things we've, we've been looking at is that resilience is not individual, resilience is systemic. So I could build the most resilient bridge uh, connecting two roads, but if those two roads get washed away, my resilient bridge is not very useful. Uh, so we're, we are starting this pilot study, which I, I mentioned earlier, where we, we are looking for each country to develop a resilience plan and how individual projects are individually resilient and how much they fit in in making the country resilient. And then we will rate projects based on that and encourage uh, local savers uh, to have a, a sort of threshold uh, of rating for resilience that they will invest in, below which they won't invest in. And, and that way we hope to mobilize domestic savings for creating a more resilient place, uh, both public money uh, and private money. The public money will focus on, on those things that the, the private sector can't do, whether it's, uh, it's, it's making affordable homes, social homes uh, more resilient, and hopefully we can get the private money the private savings mobilized to making the whole region more resilient 
by identifying those projects that generate not only a return, but also sustainability. Let's take a WhatsApp question. Let's see what this one is asking us. How do you get the regulatory changes to advance oper operationalize, sorry, operationalization of CARICOM affairs? And whose responsibility is that? Uh, so how do we operationalize CARICOM affairs and whose responsibility is that? Who's going to take that one? I think we should ask Jani to start with that. And we've, we've got some <laughs> thoughts on that. But uh, uh, this, is, this is one of her, her areas of great expertise. That's, uh, that's not fair, me and Damien. Um, I raised it. But uh, so, so, so if, we, if we go back just to the model of CARICOM, uh, and I, I feel like I'm talking to my students here, so ex excuse me if I'm being preachy. Uh, but the idea, obviously, is that we have op opted for what we call an intergovernmental model of integration, which is there's no independent entity that operates in the ether outside of the member states acting collectively. And that's why they can take decisions at the CARICOM, at the heads of government, or in the COTED, or in the COFAP, but ultimately, it's going to depend on implementation by the member states. So the persons working, whether it's the parliaments or the persons working in the ministries, to actually make them have binding force within these countries. So when we talk about these regulatory frictions that have to actually be aligned, uh, in order for a lot of these recommendations that have been made, these four of these recommendations require for the countries, in order for their recommendations to align, they need to do something with their, uh, their domestic rules, their domestic regulations. Uh, and so ultimately, in my view, to the extent uh, we're talking about uh, you know, the, the removal of the frictions, whether it's roaming charges or whether it's uh, to get insurance uh, schemes to be aligned, it really depends on the domestic uh, the domestic uh, ministries with responsibility for these specific areas to sit together and agree that they are going to recognize each other or that they are going to harmonize their regulations. So they are going to adopt the same regulations across their member states, or if they don't harmonize them and make them the same, they will recognize that there may be differences between them, but they nevertheless uh, are acceptable for the purposes that they uh, they want to pursue. I'm, I'm throwing it back to Avinash and Damien to well, talk about the regulatory alignment of right. their so, proposal. Let me just jump in and say something, though, before you come Please, in. Please, Damien. You know, in many of these instances, Janiv, as you know, when you actually go through the details of the actual regulations from country to country, you see a number of differences, but not substantive differences. You don't see differences of principle. You don't see differences of approach. What you see is differences only in the details. In other words, one hardly finds a good reason why they are not harmonious. And so it, 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 it really takes just the negotiation or the mutual recognition for us to make progress on this. Now, there's this, this question of the ferry service, which I, I wanted to raise this in the context of aviation in the region, because one of the most touching stories in the region right now is the plight of people who work with LIAT. Uh, all of this emphasis on the ferry service in the yeah. region, where does yes. that leave us <laughs> yeah. on the question me, of regional aviation? Uh, so let me explain a little bit of, about the thinking around this. This region is always is at the moment, given the state of technology, always going to have a challenge with air traffic. Uh, those of you who are familiar with with, uh, with with the air with airplanes will know that um, you know short runways, short journeys is expensive. And we used to have a set of planes. Remember those Dash eights that also were not only were they expensive, but they were didn't have much room for cargo either. So you couldn't spread the cost. A fast ferry these days with the, with the modern technology, uh, which can have over a thousand people on them, uh, these big cats that can move at 50 nautical miles an hour smoothly, you could travel between the islands for $35 for $50. Uh, and so between islands that are relatively close together, we believe that the fast ferry is an economic way of getting people across. 
The challenge is that you need to have a multiple revenue streams to make the private sector invest in it. And we also need to have cargo, need to have cars. If you have cargo, cars, and people, then it makes economic sense. And but that needs regulatory changes. Uh, and to Janine's point earlier, if we had to get all 15 countries to agree to those regulatory changes, you probably could get them, because as Damien said, they're not major differences, but it would take time. And so start off with five. Five provides the economic substance that you need to get a fast ferry service making money, uh, get those regulatory changes, and then more countries will join and the network would increase. And that will allow then uh, cheap, uh, then you'd have an integrated system of air traffic for some of the la longer routes uh, connected by ferries for some of the shorter routes. And I think that ultimately then all of us in the region will end up having cheaper uh, cheaper travel. We think that one of the big changes is not just about people though, it's about cargo. Cargo, we are, we are one of the most expensive regions in the world to move things around. And if we're going to have regional markets, it can't be so expensive. It costs a couple of $1,500 to move a container around the region. We think with a fast ferry, we could cut that cost in half and that will allow goods, food, um, manufacturing things uh, okay. to be able to transport a lot cheaper. Dr. Remy, David, but more I importantly, may, Abby, more importantly on... you can move things that are not on the scale of a 40-foot container. That is part of the problem, that you have to wait, you know, a week for the 40-foot for the container to be filled up for some of the smaller territories. Now things can be moved efficiently at smaller scale. Dr. Remy, and after that, we'll, go, we'll take an email. Yes, Dr. Ah. Remy. Yes, I just on you, you know I, I I get the point with the with the with the ferry. I'm already sitting down on the you know the deck of the ferry with my Caribbean juice as as Avi painted the picture I, the, the 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 sea breeze in my hair. I love the idea, but we're at a point now where I think with the well, let's not call it the demise. Let's not put a a, a nail yet in the coffin of Liat. I, I would love to see Liat resurface. But what happened during COVID was quite uh, amazing. We saw a cropping up, a cropping up of these indigenous airlines. We saw from from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I just came in from the you know Inter Caribbean Airways. There's you know so I think I, I like the idea of the ferry, but we are negotiating, and this was again something that came up in the uh, the negotiations yesterday in Quartet is this finalization of this multilateral air services agreement, which allows CARICOM to let these indigenous airlines thrive and grow. And so I wouldn't want to see the energy sucked out of that burgeoning new industry that is coming up and is making air travel hopefully cheaper come at the expense of a bright, shiny ferry project uh, that everybody agrees has to happen and would have its benefits because we only have so much energy in the region and where we're going to put it, where we're going to place it is really the question that we're all need. I, you know, is it I going think, to I think be it's the a, air or is it going to be the fair? I think it's a At very point important point. Existence. I think it's a very important point that air, the air and ferry are not substitutes. That the evidence of the Trinidad route is that when they actually introduced a fast ferry between Port of Spain and Scarborough, it actually increased the air ferry as the air transport as well. You just create so much more activity going on that there's a big enough demand for both. And you saw that also uh, within some of the uh, other OECS states um, when you've got some small ferry services there and the, the, the air traffic could actually, it actually supports each other. They end up being complements as you start to have a lot more inter-island activity. We'll take an email here. What happens if no other country joins the initiative after the first five countries sign on and implement? Nothing has to happen. Nothing. Nothing. And that's fine. Well, well, and it's not ideal, well, but it's not the end of, it's it's not not the end of anything. Let's no, just but, agree it's but, not the first best solution. That's that's I, I mean yeah. let or maybe it's maybe it's it's a it's a matter of degree. It's better that some do it than none do it, but it's best that all do it. Uh, I think that we the think the way to get to all to do it is for some to do it. The only well, that's the question. Is it going to incentivize or is it going to disincentivize? Oh, 
most definitely, as Damien said, reasons. the principal obstacle for people doing things is they're afraid to be first, they fear things that are actually not real. Uh, and when they see it happening and they see their fears uh, are not uh, true, then they will join in. And the second point, which was raised by Ave earlier, is then the network effects become obvious because the benefits of joining when Fiverr already have already scaled it up are greater. And then, okay. and then that incentive increases the more join. We, we, we've Actually, got a crossover to uh, one of the young interveners that we uh, had lined up, Pierre Cook Jr., who is with the Healthy Caribbean Coalition, uh, Pierre Cook Jr. Good night. With the increasing rates of non-communicable diseases across the region uh, and the amounts that our ministries of health expend each year in the treatment of non-communicable diseases, it was a bit concerning not to see mentions of investment in preventative measures uh, against these same diseases in the Caribbean. Do you agree that it's necessary for our governments to put measures in place to prevent these diseases from occurring in the first place? And how can we get our governments to commit uh, to protecting the rights of persons to the high sustainable standard of health, which would include investment in these preventative policies? We think, we, we think we've addressed it. We think it's a big issue the explosion of non-chemical diseases. And the principal cause of this is the way we eat. We eat badly. We eat processed foods, an increasing amount of processed food. We don't really have a food security problem. We have a nutrition security problem. And we think the way to deal with that, as, as has helped it happen elsewhere, when we started raising the sugar tax, it already had an impact on people switching to less sugar uh, 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 goods. You actually need to raise these taxes quite high, I'm afraid to say. Uh, but we need to uh, raise some revenues by dissuading people from eating processed foods and use those revenues to subsidize fresh foods, uh, which, will be, which will help us reduce our NCD explosion. It's a major health problem, a major fiscal problem, a major economic problem. Our, too many our people, are so, and I say that as a diabetic myself, uh, and it's all about our, our food intake and our, uh, our psychology with how we treat food. Uh, and we need to discourage us from eating processed foods and eat healthier foods. Healthier foods will also be local foods. So it's not a bad economic approach as well. Dr. Can I, Remy, can I just the, say, co the yes. cost. So, so can I just say, can I just say that I read uh, the the commission report from cover to cover, and at page forty one of the report, almost at the end, they've designated health as an essential ingredient to development, but they put it in the part of the report that actually should be nationally done with regional support. And I think uh, you know the young person who asked the question asked a, a really good question, which is we're battling for ascendancy in terms of priorities in this development model. Um, health has become a hugely critical issue. We haven't mentioned the C word once. Uh, amazing, COVID. Um, I would take health out of the nationally supported, the nationally determined subsidiarity issue, which is yeah, let's relegate it to national kind of movement and then we get regional support because health has been shown to be an area where we benefit most in CARICOM when we do it together. Front of package labeling uh, is set to hopefully, uh, and I know there are divided views on this, but to, to pass into some sort of, in one form or the other, what legislation across CARICOM, although there are some issues that have to be dealt with. So I think that the question of our health, and, and Avi made the point quite richly, uh, of it actually affecting socioeconomic out, outcomes. This is the point of being people-centered, is that these issues of socio-health uh, uh, re uh, relevance seep into our economic viability. I think COVID shows that we can't do these alone, that we need to set and implement policy. Access to vaccines uh, is something we should do collectively just because of the cost and the importance of it. So, so I, I, I think that's an excellent question and it's something that I would move up the value chain if I could, if I could have one area that I think needs, deserves more regional uh, rather than national attention in the report. We'll take another I'm going to, I'm going to push back on, on Dr. Remy, um, uh, probably to my peril, but <laughs> most definitely. I am, I am concerned 
I am concerned <laughs> that you framed the issue of subsidiarity in terms of relegation exactly <laughs> and elevation and promotion when we say that something should be dealt with at the national level it's not because it is less important that's right. what we try to what we try to work out is which are the issues which require which are advantageously dealt with at a regional level versus those where you're not giving up advantages by dealing with it, it can be dealt with adequately at the national level. And it doesn't mean every aspect of it is dealt with at the national level either. Because you mentioned the importance of, of front of package labeling. That is important to regional trade. Yeah, there should be absolutely. agreement on front of package labeling and all other labeling right. elements to facilitate trade. But the, okay, but the point is yeah. that health, we all agree that the health issue is of great importance, but we feel it can be dealt with for the most part, adequately closer to where the people are. Let's get one final email in here before we go. Why didn't the committee include sports and cultural activities as unifying forces in CARICOM? That's the question. Well, Our I, issue know, I is not... Think in oh, terms of subsidiarity, I certainly think that cricket is better dealt with at the regional level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you have some vested interest there, Damien. <laughs> we, the region has a, a great and proud history in cultural uh, things that we do together. Uh, we need to do more of those together. We, 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 I mean, people use the term cultural industries uh, very glibly. Uh, we think they're very important. Um, and we want to create regional markets uh, in those things. Um, and uh, we just don't feel necessarily you have to necessarily compartmentalize it. We think it's, a, it's an integrated part of how we live and how we uh, produce and how we consume. Um, we, we certainly didn't think it, it wasn't important. It was a, it's highly important and a key to our future. We have a time for another one, another email. Is CARICOM either able or ready to act in unison on issues given the lack of cohesion on foreign policy matters or even in the procurement of vaccines for the COVID-19 virus? Well, I think the region has actually operated quite uh, collectively on vaccines and we've actually tried to move beyond just our region. Um, as you know, Mia Motley is uh, a chair of the development committee uh, of the IMF and World Bank and has been making very strong connections with Africa and CARICOM uh, at an uh, at a, at a international level on vaccines. And, and that's an example of the kind of thing that needs to be done at a very high level. Uh, we've been calling for the creation of a single clearinghouse uh, for the buying and selling of vaccines all over the world. Um, I, I think that, um, the, you know, the, the first part of the question was, was Part of what this whole thing has been about is that there are things we can't get agreement on and just because we can't get unanimity we mustn't stop we need to keep on moving we need to unstick the caribbean by allowing us to move ahead where we can, can and I, as we can come into the one... oh david i'm yeah. sorry sorry you go, go ahead sorry. ask ask your one no, no. question uh, my one question is uh, why aren't we talking in caricom about producing vaccines this is this is not a one-off epidemic pandemic it's going to come back in one form or another i know we're utilizing the africa medical platform to procure but i was having this discussion with a friend of mine and although it's such a wonderful example of caribbean pan-africanism utilizing that forum why aren't we having discussions about making it closer to home uh you said well, utilizing a productive well, you capacity don't, you don't have a lot of time be, you don't, it would be wrong to say we've not. But it would be wrong to say we've not been discussing. That's for another people's forum, David. Definitely, definitely. Uh, as we move into the closing stages, one question which I would like to have you answer in your thirty seconds, Professor Prasad, is the urgency of all of this. Without this, what? Well, as 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 you, you yourself have said, David, the, the the world is not waiting for us. Uh, the world is moving ahead, uh, and we have a, a great opportunity. Our people are uh, highly able, determined, creative. Um, in the future, 
uh, we will be operating on global platforms and all of this is about how we make sure that our people are operating on these global platforms in a position of strength and power and able to command a better livelihoods. And if we do not do this, our people will be at the lower end of those global platforms and they will find that their incomes are getting lower and lower and able uh, and commanding a less well Dr. Uh, Dr. income Dr. and standard of living. And, and that will be something we need to change. Dr. King, 30 seconds quickly. In my 30 seconds, I would like to use the opportunity to highlight the least discussed of the recommendations. One of the things that we have learned from this pandemic is that, you know, in the Caribbean, we know all about vulnerability, uh, but we, we view vulnerability mostly in terms of, you know, hurricanes. Hurricanes, we know hurricanes are coming, we just don't know when. Uh, what we have learned from this pandemic is that, is that threats and challenges come along in ways that are completely unexpected. Thank so you. resilience takes on an even more important role and I think, therefore, the Thank role you. of not only fiscal resilience, which we know we need to have, but the importance of the growth and resilience bonds and the idea of the resilience index becomes critically yeah. important. Thank you. Well. And Dr. Remy? In my 10 seconds, I would say let's take this report and use it for the good and let us get everyone in CARICOM involved, from the youth to the women, uh, to those who care for young people, to the disabled. Let's take the report as a basis for further discussion to really make Caribbean integration, people-centered. And we certainly hope that what you've heard tonight gives some encouragement to the future because we, we are fully aware that there are many people across the Caribbean who've had their doubts and their skepticisms about any new initiatives. But what we've heard is that we are not only talking about these things, but there is actual movement already. We hope that you've enjoyed tonight's discussion and we want to thank our panel and all of those at the, at the Central Bank of Barbados who made it possible for this edition of the Caribbean Economic Forum. You have a good night. Thank <laughs> you.